We're gonna swim, bike and run In the corner sun We're gonna swim, bike and run In the corner sun 2021 Thank you, Poncho Man. Welcome, everybody, to Breakfast with Bob, not quite Kona edition. My name is Bob Babbitt. We are brought to you by Clash USA, by UCAN, Hoka One One, VeloFix, Norma Tech, Canyon Bikes, and, of course, our Challenged Athletes Foundation. We just sent out 2,021 grants, totaling $5.1 million to athletes in 94 different sports in 49 states. Our guest is a gentleman who is one of my heroes. What he is doing right now is pretty damn special. Mr. Dan Grieb joins us. Dan, how are you? I'm great. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. You know, I, I tell you, it, it, people see what Chris Dickich is doing and how he's changing the world. A young man with Down syndrome. Uh, nobody would have thought a year or two ago that somebody with Down syndrome could do something like the Ironman. Take me back to, well, first, Take me back to you getting into this sport and how important this relationship with Chris has been to you. Yeah, well, I, I got into the sport like a lot of people did because I, I needed a challenge. I needed to lose weight. You know, uh, six years ago, I was 330 pounds and uh, I wanted to lose 100 pounds. And uh, I asked someone, you know, what's a tough event that I could do and sign up for that would require that I not only you know, got myself fit, but then had to stay at that level of fitness. And somebody said, you should do an Ironman. And I said, well, tell me about that. And they said, well, most people train for a whole year and they do this Ironman. It's 140.6 miles. You have to swim, bike and run. And I'm like, that sounds like a great idea, but I'm not like everybody else. So I'm going to 10 exit. I'm going to train for a year and then I'm going to do 10 Ironman events. So I did, <laughs> I did 10 Ironman events. Yeah. I did 10 Ironman events all over the world from New Zealand to Mexico, Texas, uh, Puerto Rico, um, St. George, Utah, Florida. I mean, just, you know, Dubai. I went everywhere and did these events over two years. And um, it was time for me to kind of wrap it up. I had done, you know, I'd lost a hundred plus pounds. I had accomplished a lot of things. I ended up being in the top 100 in my age group for that year. Um, I did a half and five hours did a full wow. hour. So I was, I was getting there and, um, and I think it's time to retire, but I was like, how do I thank God for allowing me to restore my health in my forties and, and become, you know, like this really elite athlete or, or, or compete with elite athletes. And the answer is simple. It is service people. And so I started looking for someone that I could guide through an Ironman. And when did you connect with, with Chris and his dad, Nick? Well, that journey actually took about a year because once I was done and then I wanted to guide someone, I started looking for a person that was blind because at the time it was only blind people yes. that you could lead or an incapacitated person. And incapacitated families aren't going to let you take their, their child or, or adult in, you know, in a raft and do all that. It's really hard. So I started looking for a blind person and um, I jokingly tell this joke all the time, Bob. I say, what do you think is the hardest part about leading a blind person through an Ironman? What do I think? Yeah. Is, is the, the hardest part to me, because I've led a buddy of mine, Tom Sullivan, not through an Ironman, but a short distance race, is just the mental stress of always being worried about them, about every tree limb, every crack in the road. What was the hardest part for you? Well, I never led a person with, with, that was blind through an Ironman, but my answer is the hardest part about leading a blind person through an Ironman is finding a blind person that wants to do an Ironman. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, the, the Ironman community is fantastic and it's full of great human beings. So for every, every one blind person that wants to do an Ironman, there's a thousand people that are willing to guide them. Right. And for, for me, I, I couldn't find anybody. So I was starting to feel like I wasn't going to be able to do this thing I wanted to do to, to serve humanity and God. And, um, and that's when I met Chris Nickage. Now, when you becoming an Ironman is not about swimming, biking and running. It's about changing who you are. Success is not about what you, what you do. It's about who you become in the process. And I mm -hmm. wanted to teach someone else how I became an Ironman. Not I did a race and they gave me a medal, but that I started learning how to be disciplined with my time, eat the right foods, sleep the right, eat the right nutrition, rehab from injuries, you know, fight the mental battles that are so necessary to be a good husband and a, 
and a good wife and a good father and a good spouse and a good leader in your community. And that's what I wanted to give someone. And then um, just by, by luck, Special Olympics was partnered with our local triathlon group. However, I was out of town for that meeting and I missed the opportunity. So um, I, was, I, I was kind of upset that I couldn't even help a, a Special Olympics athlete. I'm like, it's just not gonna work out for me. And a couple of weeks later, um, I was at a, our kickoff meeting and Chris Nickage and his dad walks in and the person that was putting the group together said, hey, uh, I, I got somebody that I'd like you to guide. He's doing a sprint, but he's actually too fast for his current guide. And his dad's looking for someone that has a huge heart, tons of energy, and that is willing to give his son a chance. And I said, I'd absolutely love to do that. And uh, that was the beginning of, of my relationship with Chris Nickage. So that first race that you did together, what were the, what did you find to be the challenges? Well, I mean, the first race, the biggest challenges for me is that um, I didn't understand Down syndrome. You yeah. know, before I met Chris Nickage, I never met a single person in my life that had Down syndrome. I, I'm 46 years old for 45 years of my life. I never met anybody that had Down syndrome, had a child with Down syndrome, cousin with Down syndrome, anything. So I don't understand a lot of it. So I didn't know what was possible. Um, so for me, that was the hardest part uh, is just really understanding what his limitations were, what, his lim what he had to overcome and, and those type things. But Chris has, a, like, like a lot of people with Down syndrome, they have great attitudes and they're very kind and loving. And, uh, and Chris and I became friends quickly and he always wanted to please me. And he still does. And, uh, um, and so it made it easy for me to, to, to guide him and work with him. The challenges that we deal with now are significantly different than the challenges we dealt with then because the stakes are a lot higher now. So it's, it's fascinating to me the first time I interviewed Nick and Chris together and Nick explained to me that it took him a while to realize that it is a lot of times Down syndrome kids are told, you'll never be able to ride a bike, you'll never be able to do this or never be able to do that. And Nick realized, if, forget the word never, it's just you, our kids learn differently. And what might take a, a, a able-bodied kid five days to learn how to balance on a bike, it might take someone down syndrome a month. But after a month, then they're going 20 miles, 30 miles, 40 miles, 50 miles pretty quickly. What did you see in terms of Chris's growth as an athlete? Well, I mean, you're exactly what you said is uh, Chris's learning is different. You know, Down syndrome is an intellectual disability that basically – you know, has physical and intellectual issues. And his intellectual issue is basically like this. Our brains are five lanes of traffic. So five lanes of traffic go down our brains. Well, Chris only has two lanes of traffic. So he processes everything slower. So um, what I what I noticed about Chris is that he loves his, his disability also has, gives him superpowers, which is he loves routine. He loves to do the same things over and over again. So he'll do the same thing over and over again. And, and his improvements are so slight that they actually look like he's going backwards, but he's actually improving. And that time on task over time uh, ends up creating a geometric progression, a, a, a real build, big building block for him. And so Chris, when I first met him, he could barely ride his bicycle um, at any real, for any real distance or at any real pace. Now he can ride his bicycle 100 miles um, and at a clip of 15, 17 miles an hour, which is significant difference from where he started in just 18 months, 19 months. Yeah. And when you're talking about going swimming, it's one thing to be in a pool and being next to somebody and there's a wall 25 yards away. It's another thing when you're looking out at, this, at the ocean with buoys that look like they're in the next zip code. Yeah. And I'm imagining, and then you could be, you're out in the middle of the ocean or in a bay with somebody's child. I mean, that's, that's a lot of responsibility. And I can see where, you know, Chris could panic and it could be a tough situation. Yeah, that, there's a lot of risks to, to this uh, athletic endeavor. I mean, triathlons are hard. Uh, you have obviously all of the issues that can occur in the water from uh, people swimming over you, from issues with our tether. Chris does swim tethered to me. So he's attached to me. So I direct 
the you know direct it where he goes uh and, and you can have a tremendous amount of problems in the water you know waves uh typical jellyfish things rocks reefs all kinds of things that that can hurt you there but then on the bicycle you have the same issues you have you know a bicycle crash you, you know dehydration lack of proper nutrition um and the run the same thing you know you're pushing him to the extent of human exertion i mean there is no down syndrome division in iron man you know it's it's all or nothing. You either finish or you don't. You either are an Ironman or you're not. They don't give you extra time. They don't give you any head starts. There's no, you know, conveyor belt. You get to get on if you have a disability. You have to run just like everybody else. You have to manage your nutrition like everybody else. And that's my job. Um, it's a tremendous responsibility and one that I believe that I'm up to. Um, and I don't take it lightly. Now, what your what your um, your audience doesn't know is that Chris has an intellectual disability. And if you interview him and you ask him how long the swim is, he can tell you it's 2.4 miles. If you ask him how long the bike is, he can tell you that. If you ask him how long the total event is, he can tell you. But he has no idea what one mile is versus 100 miles. And, and I want you to think about that intellectually, the, what he does. Yeah. So if I was to say, Bob, how about you and I go for a jog? And you, you would always ask two questions. Sure, Dan, how long do you want to run? How far and how fast? <laughs> Right, and then right. you'll make a decision, yes or no. Like, you want to run 30 miles, that eight-minute mile? No, thank you. Not interested. But if you said, run a mile, and we're going to do it in 14 minutes, oh, no problem. I'd be down for that. I could do that. Chris has no idea how far we're going because he cannot intellectually determine that. So when you and I are doing a marathon and we're on the 22nd mile, we know we only have four miles to go. So we can rationalize, I'm only going to be in pain for another 40 minutes. I can, I can last 40 minutes. This cramp, you know, will go, I can deal with that. Chris has no idea from the moment he starts the race and gets in the water, he has, he's going to get into pain associated with racing. And he has no idea when that pain will end. No idea. He doesn't, he can't, he doesn't tell time and he has no idea what distance is. So he just trusts that his uncle Dan will keep him safe and he's going to do it with me. And more importantly is his dad has done, his dad and mom have done an incredible job of teaching Chris that his dream is on the other side of this obstacle. And Chris wants his dream so badly that he is willing to take unlimited pain to accomplish his dream. And he loves being included with his uncle Dan and all his, what he calls my crazy Iron Man friends he loves being included so much that he's willing to be in pain just so he can be around people like me and just so he can have a chance at his dream. And I think that's a question that really all of us as what we call typical athletes, yeah, we asking ourselves like, how much pain are you willing to, to endure for your dreams? And, and how bad do you really want to be included? Because if you are, how much pain are you willing to accept for that? So cool. I mean, I always look at our sport because we've been working with, you know, with our Challenge Athletes Foundation for 27 years. And I look at our sport as an equal opportunity abuser. It doesn't <laughs> care, right? Missing yeah. a leg, missing an arm, in a wheelchair, intellectual disability. It doesn't matter. A to get from point A to point B. Right. So what, when you guys went to the starting line of Ironman Florida in November, talk about, like you said, no sense of time, no sense of uh, direction and how long it's going to be, how far it's going to be. Do you break things down into small segments? That's just funny. As athletes, I always did that, right? You, you, 2.4 mile swim seemed like a hell of a long way. But when you're going along, you're going, oh, I'm a quarter of the way to the turnaround. I'm halfway to the turnaround. I'm at the turnaround. Is that the type of stuff you do with Chris to, to keep him uh, on task? Yeah, well, uh, the, the answer is, the short answer is yes. Uh, Chris likes loop, what he calls loops. So he'll ask me, how many loops is the swim? And I'll just say it's two loops. How many loops is the bike? One loop. How many butt on the run? Two. So he, he, he gets comfort around that. Now the swim, he really doesn't have any issues with because he doesn't feel a lot of pain swimming. So he's fine right. with swimming for as long as necessary. The bike, um, we do that. And Chris doesn't really understand like we're a quarter of the way there. He only understands mentally in his head halfway halfway means i'm almost done so it, even if we're at 90 percent, and i say we're halfway done he's like oh great we're halfway done like even to him that's more important than me telling him like we're we're 90 percent done 
halfway is more <laughs> better to him. He likes that because that means we're turning around or ever we get to a point where I say, this is the turnaround spot or see down there when we get there, we're going to turn around. Oh, that's the turnaround spot. And then we're going to head back. And I'm like, yeah, we're going to head back. And he goes, okay. And like, it doesn't matter. The head back is like 13 miles away. <laughs> it's, it's still, we're, we're heading back. <laughs> so in Florida, uh, you, you guys had a lot of issues, right? There are the red ants and just, you know, and when Chris eats and drinks, which is a huge part of about the long distance races, he needs to do that stopped, correct? He doesn't, he can't r- eat and drink while he rides or runs. Uh, yeah. For the most part, I walk him when he, when he takes his nutrition and hydration. Mm-hmm. Uh, he doesn't really do that uh, on the run, but I'm teaching him to do that running now. He carries his own water bottle. Um, Hawaii will be entirely too hot for me to carry his water, my water, uh, even though the water stops are every mile, we'll probably need to take uh, a lot more nutrition than we did in Florida. Oh, so yeah. uh, he's got to carry his own water bottle now. And so I'm teaching him to do that. Uh, but on the bike, he absolutely has to, we have to stand him down for his nutrition. And obviously the clock is still ticking. So when you're at Florida and the clock is still ticking and Chris has to stop, that's got to be really, really tough uh, for, because he doesn't really have that sense of urgency, right? Where you have to have that urgency for him. You're exactly right. Mm-hmm. That's true. I got to, I got to, I got to keep him moving. And it's, uh, and uh, it's hard, you know, because again, he has no idea how far we've gone. He has no idea how much further we have left. He just knows that his dream's on the other end of this. And I just got to keep him pointed towards his dreams. When you guys finished Florida, and it was, you know, one of those seismic moments, right? I think it's, it's probably the most impactful story. And we've had a lot of great stories at Ironman, Dick and Rick Hoyt and Jim McLaren and so many others but I don't think we've ever had a story that touched nerves all over the world like this story. Yeah. Were you surprised when all of a sudden this, this uh, people, everybody knew who Chris Nickich was because he was changing the world. Um, yeah. I mean, I knew what was coming because, you know, I had prepared for it. I, I act as Chris's kind of business manager as well. I'm involved in, in a lot more than just the racing with him now. Um, and I could hear and I could feel the weight of the Down syndrome world. You know, when we got in that water that morning, the Down syndrome, the intellectually dis- disabled, the Special Olympics world, they, they all took a big sigh. They all took a, took, a, took a big deep breath and they held their breath for 17 hours. Mm-hmm. And, and they all said, please, God, let this boy finish so that my son can matter my daughter can matter too my sister my my cousin can matter too because they live a life being told that their children will grow up and they will not accomplish much they won't matter Um, in some countries uh 99 of the people that are told that your children have down syndrome are aborted um there are people that will now enter the world as a result of Chris Nickage completing an Ironman. They'll even, they'll get a chance at life because of Chris. And then there are parents that have lived their whole lives hopeless with the idea that my child will never amount to anything and they're gonna live a mostly uneventful life here with me. And then, you know, then I'm gonna pass away and I don't know what's gonna happen to them. They're gonna get institutionalized or whatever. They're going to go to bed and they're still going to bed hopeless and they turn their TV on and they see a story about a boy with Down syndrome who completes an Ironman or, or does something great and they, and they wake up with a hope that, wait a second, maybe my child could function semi-independently, could, could come to something. And I've been hearing those stories uh, all along. So when, when we cross that finish line and, uh, and and our and Chris's Instagram went from you know, five thousand followers to fifty five thousand followers. When my personal Facebook uh, messenger and Instagram went from you know average 10, 15, 20 messages a day to six hundred you know thousand messages a day okay. from all over the world. Google Translate, um, and, you know, and you got to work hard to know who I am because my vest says guide. It doesn't have my name on it. You know, I'm I'm just the guide. I'm just there with them. You know, I'm. I'm uh, I'm like the I'm like the groom at a wedding, 
it's, uh, you know, you could replace me with anybody, you know, there's still going to be a wedding. It's for the bride. Um, I'm just there to help the young man, you know, accomplish his mission and, and be his eyes and ears sometimes be his cheerleader, make sure he takes the nutrition on time and keep him safe. Um, but I knew that, that something good was happening. I could feel that, that God was moving the world and changing the world. And um, it was something I prayed that God would let me do when I was a young man. They let me do something that would change the world. And uh, the funny thing about God is he doesn't answer the prayers the way you think. He answers them better. He, uh, he allowed me to help someone else change the world, which is a lot more fulfilling than changing the world yourself. And he allowed me to help someone else change the world for someone and for a part of community that doesn't even impact me. I don't, I don't have a Down syndrome brother or cousin, sister. Uh, wh whether they, they felt hope or didn't, I, I didn't know anything about that until I met Chris. So um, the honor that I got to stand next to someone that has changed the world uh, is an honor of a lifetime. How has this journey changed you? Oh, it's changed me in a million ways. Number one is I'm uh, a lot more patient uh, with people in general. Mm. I've learned how to speak um, new languages. I, I, I've learned to speak, you know, what we call speak down syndrome, which is most people with down syndrome, they speak with a thick tongue. They have thicker tongues. So they, and I, and I can, I can understand every person I speak to with down syndrome and they all speak with a different accent because their tongues are different. Their, their mouths are, are, are formed differently, but I, I can understand them all. And it's because I've learned to listen very carefully to what they say. Um, and I used to not listen to people. I used to make up in my head what they were saying as they were speaking. And now I, I listen very carefully to people. Um, I, I've changed the way that I personally uh, train I don't train as hard as I did before uh, because, um, you know, I can't train Chris like that. I, um, I make all my training fun. I, uh, I work really hard. I don't make any excuses. And my, my desire is just to get 1% better every day, just like Chris. And I don't have to be in pain to get better. No. Um, how often are you guys training together? Um, right now, we're still kind of like in our slow season. I only do long workouts with Chris. So I train with him two to three, maybe four days a week. Uh, but but in the next probably 30 days, I'll be training with him five days to seven days a week. I'll work out with him probably 30 hours a week. Have you seen just a change in his confidence level through all of this? Just the fact that he's become... Uh, is everybody knows who he is. He goes to the races. He's a star. I was there in Honu for the 70.3 Hawaii. And it was like Elvis entering the arena when Chris walked out to the swim star, right? Does, does, do you see that he's loving that, 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 that love that he's getting is filling him up? Um, the answer is, uh, short answer is uh, yes. Chris is not, does not generate confidence from that. And like, like the arrogant confidence he feels included and he gets more people to hug and love. And that's important. His parents are the ones that are affected. Their confidence is in increased because they know that, listen, reality is if you have a child with special needs, like they do, your first hope is that that child would have a good life. Yes. And then your second fear is that what's going to happen to them when I pass away. Well, the Nickages don't have to worry about that anyway. They can they can die knowing that Chris has a community of people that will love him and support him and care for him uh, when they pass away. And and that inclusion that Chris has received through this amazing community of Iron Man um, has changed the world for them too. And uh, and and that's the that's a real uh, fun thing that I get to see and be part of. So when you came over to Hawaii, and this is one of the things that when I was chatting with Chris and Nick at Daytona, I was like, you guys are going to do some camps over in Kona, right? Because Kona is, as you know, a different animal than any other race because of the wind and the heat and just, it's just an intense situation. If that, if that course was in a bubble, it's a fast course, but it's not in the bubble. <laughs> <laughs> what did you take away from your time training and the, and also race day race day was pretty darn windy on that, uh, heading out to Javi. That was, that yeah. was pretty scary for me. Yeah, it was, uh, well, number one is, you know, uh, 
uh, you know, whenever you do an Ironman, you don't train for three events. You don't train for the bike, the run, and the swim. You actually train for four events, the, the bike, the run, the swim, and the fourth element. And you never know what that fourth element is, and it doesn't show up till race day. Um, it could be high winds and you get a lot of waves. It could be high winds on the, on the, on the, on the bike course or headwind. It can be crosswinds that are very dangerous. It could be heat, the extreme heat, like they just had in Coeur d'Alene, you know, where 1200 people not finish, uh, or it could be extreme cold or rain. It could be anything. You just don't know till race day. Well, for us, we actually arrived two weeks early and we rode up to Javi a couple of times and had almost zero wind. So yeah. we were thinking like, are what's the big deal? <laughs> yeah, what is, what is their problem? Like, everybody's losing their mind over this wind. Like, what's the big deal? And uh, and on race day, we got we, we learned what the wind was. We, we learned the hard way on the wind. So we learned, we learned that. Um, the hills are not nearly as frightening as we thought they were going to be. Yeah. Um, the, the grading is not that big of a deal uh, for us. Chris is strong. Yeah. He can do it. Um, you know, Chris doesn't clip in. And he right. doesn't. He uses flat and, pedals. Yeah, right? and he doesn't use an aero bar, so he's actually in a higher position, which creates more wind resistance for him. So, um, but we've learned that 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 his pedals, his bike, we have him on, all of that actually tested out very well. Um, his braking system worked out for the most part. He got he skid he got into a skid one time during the race. Uh, we're working on his braking system, but overall. We, we actually left uh, feeling more confident that he could do it. Now, we just got to put in a lot, a hell of a lot of training because of the gruels of the course. But in terms of the number one issue that his parents have, uh, I was able to check that box for them. And that is that he can do it safely. Yes. Now, can he do it fast enough to complete the whole race? Uh, we won't know that answer until, uh, what, October 7th? Ninth. Yeah. <laughs> the ninth or whatever, the race day. Um, yeah. But in terms of, you know, will the winds not take him off his bike? No. Will they push him into a guardrail? No. Will he, can he ride across the rumble strips without freaking out? Yep. He's fine. Uh, so, so his safety is going to be okay. Yeah. Now it's just a question of, uh, you know, will, will we be able to build his endurance enough to, to endure uh, that, that day? Now, in all your years of doing triathlon and when you did, you know, 10 Ironmans, have you done Kona before? Never. Mm -mm, I've never qualified. Um, I, I'm, I'm in the 40 to, I was in the 40 to 45 age division, which is like, Good luck. you got to be a pro to win that one. Um, exactly. so, so, so I wasn't going to get, I wasn't going to be seeing the uh, Kona as a competitor uh, unless I was signing up to give away Gatorade, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Um, uh, but, uh, Chris Nickage, you know, I included him in my world, gave him a chance to just see how far he could go. And Chris has returned the favor a thousand times by now including me in his world. And, uh, here's what we discovered. Chris's world is a lot bigger than mine. And the coolest part, I remember we were down at, I think it was challenge Daytona, uh, or Miami. One of, I think it was Daytona where Chris was racing and to me, the most important aspect of that, I think there was three other Down syndrome kids participating in the sprint that day, which that's what it comes down to. You don't want Chris in a vacuum. You want other kids and parents to realize that they, if Chris can do it, they can do it. Yeah, yeah. So so um, we've already seen the next generation of uh, folks with Down syndrome uh, on their way up. There's a 14-year-old out of Jacksonville that uh, Chris and I um, had spent some time with. He just completed his first uh, sprint triathlon and he's building to an Olympic. Um, we've got the, uh, a young lady that completed with Down syndrome that completed a sprint triathlon. We've got other um, eight folks with uh, intellectual disabilities. We've got probably the largest triathlon team in the nation here in Orlando now. And we got more and more people saying, let's do it. Now, um, Nick, Chris's dad and I have already made the commitment that wherever in the world, the person, second person with Down syndrome enters an Ironman. So they have, you know, to enter an Ironman, you've got to, you got to probably do a, a 70.3. You got to yeah. do a marathon. You got to do an Olympic. You got to do a lot. I mean, everybody does. So that means you have to have already passed a lot of the hurdles, jumped a lot of the hurdles to get to a full Ironman. But wherever in the world that second person is, Nick and I are going to go there and we're going to help them. We're going to help them be faster than Chris. We're going to help them uh, do better than them. We're gonna help them, that person 
get a Guinness Book of World Record as being the fastest person with Down syndrome to complete an Ironman, beat Chris's record. We 100% want that. And then when the second person, third one comes along, we're going to go wherever they are in the world and we're going to help them beat the first two, Chris and this person, and become the Guinness Book World Record as the fastest person with Down syndrome to complete an Ironman. And the reason why is because right now, Chris might, you know, be labeled as an anomaly. He's just an anomaly. He's a fluke. Exactly. The second one is we might be on to something. And the third one is validation. Um, there will be a time, hopefully in my lifetime, where I sign up for an Ironman. And uh, folks with intellectual disabilities with Down syndrome are just normal. They're just all out there. They're just integrated into our society as Ironmen. And if they can enter into this environment and succeed, then they can enter into the job force, no doubt about it. Because what it takes to be an Ironman uh, uses every bit of the uh, strength, knowledge, and understanding that you would need to hold the majority of jobs that are out there today. There are some things that intellectually they may not be ready for, but there are others, I would say, 50% or more that they could do. Um, and if they can do an Ironman, they, they can work in a, in a lot of places. You know, it's fascinating that obviously I've been covering the Ironman going back to like 1980 when the earth was still cooling. And, <laughs> you know, we got wheelchair athletes in for the first time in 1994 and, you know, 94, 95, 96, uh, nobody could make the cutoff times, right? They couldn't make the bike cutoff time. Finally, uh, John McClain from Australia made the cutoff time in 97. And the following year, a guy named Carlos Moleda went 10.55, which would have won the first, t- uh, first three Ironmans overall. Right. Wow. So you're changing those perceptions. And we've seen that at Ironman over and over again. And, and you guys are, are doing something very, very special for that next generation. What will it mean to you and Chris to finish in Kona and finish under all those cutoff times? Yeah, well, I mean, it don't mean a lot. It'll mean a lot for for Chris, for everything that he represents. Um, you know, I my what I, what it'll mean for me is you is usually like the last question because it, you know like I said it's really not relevant to me it's relevant to Chris and, and his mission and his journey and his story and those that follow, follow behind him and and um and that's and that's the thing that's important Chris has already done everything he needs to do Chris is an iron man once you yes. become an iron man you're always an iron man they can't take it away from you um it's yours you've earned it so doing a second doesn't mean you're like, you know, a senior Iron Man or, uh, you know, level two Iron Man. You're just an Iron Man. Yeah. It's still the same. So the only reason why Chris still is going to continue to do Iron Man is to continue to raise the ceiling of what's possible for everyone that follows behind him, and to show others what they can also do and become. Now, just like in the typical world, like yours and ours, um, there are people that are going to watch your show and say like. I could probably do a 140.6 mile race. I just have no desire to do that. I would rather figure skate or, or not be involved in athletics and focus on my education or do something else of anything. Right. Well, there's going to be folks with Down syndrome that don't either, that decide they don't want to, or, or their families feel like that's not the right direction for them. And that's perfectly fine. But they'll at least have a model of success. And it's called just getting 1% better. Getting 1% better in your area. And there'll be proof that it's possible because Chris did it in this area. And now we should strike out and try it in this area and this other area or this next area. And, um, and the greatest gift that Chris will give his community when he completes the Ironman in Kona, Hawaii is he will just give them more hope. He'll give them a higher ceiling of achievement to strive for. I love it. Dan, I look forward to meeting you in person in Kona. We'll do this with the same setting with our guy, Poncho Man, and uh, our Huggos on the Rocks coming up in October. And I, I can't wait to, to see you guys in person. This, I love what you're doing. And I, I know that this is all about Chris, but at the same time, this doesn't happen without you. What you're doing is a, is a very selfless act. And I know that you, you are gaining so much from it, but at the same time, you're also encouraging other people to go, who could use my help? Absolutely. Who could use my help to, to reach their goal and to live their dreams? And I appreciate everything you're doing. Well, thank you. It's a, it's a complete honor. 
you know, a big thank you today. I mean, there's so many people I could thank, but I want to just say this. I want to thank Iron Man because when people said a boy with Down syndrome uh, doing an Iron Man is impossible, you know what they said? Bring it anything, on. Anything's possible. It's true. Even to people with Down syndrome, anything's possible. We will not have a closed mind. And you know what? Thank you, Iron Man, for um, believing in your own slogan. And living it and breathing it every day. Uh, 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 yet again. <laughs> Dan Grieve has been our guest. Dan, thank you so much for taking time. I, I look forward to seeing you guys in Kona. God bless you. Thank you. Again, Breakfast with Bob, not quite Kona edition. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We'll catch you next time. See ya. <laughs>